to make it perfect. Think of that there. What else? Uh, I went. I'm Adam Weiss. Donner is the leader of the mobile app and basic email. Have your photos printed, framed, secured once. Hello, Tamara. And although you and your friends Kelsey remain still around family, the Democrats here, because they want to say goodbye to Jada Swift, is clearly being told. Did it come out in the presidential? Hello, Ron. You're mute. Hello. Um, could you start the link? Uh, so yeah, I started it. I started it already. Okay. Um, don't forget to record this. Yeah, don't forget to record it. Um, let me. Uh, share screen. Yeah, yeah. Log in so I can make you um a co-presenter. Or are you are you already made a co-presenter? Hello, Ron. I can't hear you. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> yeah, Tim. All right. Looks out there on issues like LGBTQ rights and encouraging people to vote and common sense things that far right. You need it, Bob. I'm all. Conservatives need to calm down because Taylor Swift is not going to rig the Super Bowl and they just need to shake it off because she's not going to come out and endorse Biden during the halftime show. But I think Alicia, the issue here, the end game for these conspiracy theorists is that with Swift out there encouraging people to vote, they want to suppress the vote because they know when more people go out and vote, it doesn't help far-right conspiracy, you know, skewing conservatives. And so what they want to do is try to keep her from doing that, and they want to discredit her. And secretly, Alicia, they wish that she was advocating for them, but not in their wildest dreams no. And all of this comes down to the fact that there is a blank space in the Super Bowl. They are trying to write Taylor Swift's name into it, but the only names that are going to be written in that blank space are either the Chiefs or the 49ers. This is about the game. Stop the distraction. Let this girl love who she wants. Miles, so someone in the control room tried to count just how many Taylor Swift songs that was. I think we got to seven or eight. Kudos to you. I want to know how long that took to rehearse. And here's the thing, I think. She was around how long are we? Are we just talking about this to talk about Taylor Swift? And the answer is no. We are talking about this because folks on the right seem to be taking this very seriously. And we're trying to understand what to make of that. Little Stone said three people familiar with the matter in reporting Matt Lance's upper crust 
is plotting to declare what one source described as a forward war on Taylor Swift should she endorse President Biden again. That reporting indicates several conservative figures have gone so far as to talk about it with the disgrace ex president. And it, it us. Okay, you sound work this thing. Yeah, you, you you can I can hear you now. Okay, you can hear me? Yep. Can't okay. see you, but I can hear you. Okay, I'm gonna navigate this thing. And hopefully I stay we'll stay on. Oh. What I do? In politics, and the Republicans would absolutely love to have her. I did something wrong. So, what's their alternative? Their alternative is to demonize her um, and try to make sure that she doesn't have the reach that they feel she was going to have. And the six senators, this is one Georgia district chair who called her, and I love this, Lisa Curia, which is just one of the archaic, but not just demonic Lisa Curia. And, and that's what they're trying to do. They, they don't want somebody who's such a powerful asset as Taylor. Oh, I've done something wrong. Yeah. Something wrong. I find it really weird. Uh, I'm logged in, but my screen's like closed. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Ye
Am I dark? I'm dark, right? Yep. Oh, okay. Well, if I do that video, you can you cannot start your video because your host has stopped it. Okay, Bam. that's fine with me. Okay. Well, do you have uh, audio? Yeah, I'm good now. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, good. Can you see my screen? All right. Well, I'm going to log out. Okay. Appreciate all of you. Glad to be here. I have a... Uh, Mr. Hans, could you get, just give me access before you leave? Um. Um, as host. Um, I sent you a request for recording. Um, oh, goodness. Um, Okay. I allowed you to record. Um, do you have hosting uh, site capabilities? I'm not right now. I think I'm a panelist, so if you can give me access to that. Oh, that's the round somewhere. Oh. I did I forget how to give you a host? Uh, there's like three dots next to my video. I think they'll show up. Oh, Mr. yeah. All right. So if I log off, um, that you still stay on, won't you? Um, I think yeah. If I'm, I'm, you made me host, right? Yes. All right then. Yeah, you should. You should be good. Okay. Call me if I if if you need me. Sounds good. So I think we'll go ahead and start around 6.05. Um, I think everybody, all the speakers have joined though. So we'll let a few more people join. Right then, um, we have a few people logged in, so let's um, we'll go ahead. 
Um, thank you everybody for being here. Um, the topic for the conversation today um, is part of our Black Community Development webinar series, um, and it's preserving heritage, empowering communities, and unveiling the stories of Black historic districts. Um, we have Elijah Davis here tonight as our moderator. One second. Um, Elijah is a native of Mobile, Alabama. Elijah is a community economic development practitioner, consultant, and researcher. He is also a co-founder of HANS, a network working to preserve, enhance, and elevate historic Black neighborhoods and commercial districts by strengthening connections between people who serve them. In 2023, Elijah was named the Next City Vanguard, and in 2022 received the Birmingham Business Journal's 40 Under 40 Award. Um, Elijah will also be the moderator for tonight's event. We have Ronald Miles. Throughout his career, career Miles served, uh, received numerous awards, including recognition from Mayor Carl L. Schmoke for his role in bringing $100 million to Baltimore City. As a key figure in housing initiatives, he expanded the Neighborhood Housing Services Program in Atlanta, Baltimore, and Milwaukee, addressing affordable housing for low to moderate income families. Notably, Miles serves as a field officer director with the Department of Housing and Urban Development in Tulsa, actively resettling over 1,500 families during the Rita Katrina hurricane. Hurricanes. His leadership facilitated the reappropriation of $5 million for HUD's Community Block Grant Program in Tulsa. Miles is also deeply involved in volunteerism, contributing to organizations such as the NAACP and the 100 Black Men of America. He's a proud mem member of the Omega Psi fraternity. In 2019, Miles also founded the Arch RJY Chick Web Council. He's currently negotiating a $20 million project with the City of Baltimore, aiming to transform the center and contribute to community development. We have Regina Silas. Regina is the founder and CEO of the JBS Foundation. She holds degrees in culinary arts and agribusiness from Lee Corden Blue College and Johnson and Wales University. A certified global food tech entrepreneur, she aims to unite the African diaspora through sustainable development and agriculture. Gina co-founded the Golden Time LLC and established I Am Vision LLC, a clothing line honoring influential women. Engaging in community service since high school, inspired by her grandfather's civil rights activism, she co-founded the Hope Campaign and later the JBS Foundation, addressing economic disparities and food insecurity. And then we have Tamara Prosper. Tamara's career displays her desire to serve. With her husband, she co-owns Show Fresh Sustainable Foods, a business that has been providing fresh, locally sourced produce to combat New Orleans food apartheid since 2011. She also owns Legacy Tours, sharing Black, vibrant, sharing vibrant Black and Indigenous histories of New Orleans and other locations. A former nursing home administrator and community health worker, Tamara is an advocate for the elderly, especially those with dementia and other forms of cognitive decline. She views her current work as a lone steward with Cooperation New Orleans as a way to address the root cause of many health disparities experienced by members of the global majority, structural economic limitations. Tamara is also the author of The Elders, a, co a columnist for Anti-Gravity magazine and a public speaker. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here tonight um, and for this conversation. Um, and I'm going to hand over the conversation to Elijah now. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I'm so glad. Thank you, Amal, for that. And thank you to Network for Development and Conscious Communities uh, for the invitation. Um, I'm excited for this discussion. Um, and uh, I can't see you all, but I'm trusting that y'all are having fun. So just a few ground rules. Um, you know, it's okay to multitask, eat some dinner, all that good stuff, but really uh, engage. There is a question and answer uh, chat feature at any time. Let us know uh, what you uh, want to do, um, you know, and any questions you may have. We want this to be as interactive uh, and helpful as possible. Um, and really, uh, we look forward to the engagement and the start of this uh, discussion. So we, uh, you know, lighten up this evening time. We understand, and uh, but we're here to to uh, think about some stuff, get some work done. And uh, I am just so glad to be hosted uh, by uh, NDCC as well as 
um, be in the presence of such great panelists. So with that being said, um, you know, we uh, believe in story and believe in understanding and how we get anchored into all of this work and to anchored in place. There is no place really without people. Uh, many of us believe. So what I'd like to do is for everyone in their own words to sort of introduce themselves, um, introduce their work and interest, introduce their tie uh, to the neighborhood. Following that, I'll, I'll begin to talk a little bit about the work we do at HANDS and lead into just some framing around Black uh, historical districts. And then we'll get into a rich discussion uh, with some of our panelists around uh, how to preserve, promote, and empower uh, the people in the districts as well as the districts themselves. Uh, and then we want to hear from you in an interactive discussion. So we're really excited um, about this. So with that, I'll kick it off uh, to Ms. Regina Silas. Uh, please tell us um, about the JBS Foundation, uh, how you got there a little bit, and, and your tie to that neighborhood and work. Um, yes, my name is Regina Silas, and I'm the founder of the JBS Foundation, Inc. The foundation is in honor of my late grandfather. He was a civil rights activist in Miami-Dade County. Um, he was the first black police officer on motorcycle for the county. He started the first black union, which was the largest black organization in Miami-Dade County history. He sued the county for racism and discrimination and won. He held the first ever conference given on a black male in the history of the state of Florida. Um, I got here through, basically, I've been giving back since my youth and doing charity events and toy drives. I started my first um, nonprofit called the Hope Campaign when I was 24 years old. And it was just about reaching out to children and women living in homeless shelters throughout Miami-Dade County. Then when my grandfather passed away, I decided to get more heavily involved in um, community development. And I sat on Liberty Square board. Liberty Square, they just released a, um, a documentary last night on PBS about it. And I was over the community service as well as the education committee. And then I started moving my, um, I'm sorry, I didn't realize my camera was off. I just looked inside of the um, the chat. And then I started moving my efforts towards Opalaka. The city of Opalaka has the largest collection of Moorish architectural art in the Western Hemisphere. So I'm looking to bring the history of the Moors to the city of Opalaka where I'm creating economic and community development. And my grandfather did a lot of work in the city of Opalaka as well. Opalaka is a community that's located in Miami-Dade County and it's pr predominantly black. So my goal is to connect the African roots to the city of Opelika and the Moors because it just not, it's just not about the architectural art in the buildings, it's about the substance of the people and what the architectural art means. So historically, Opelika is the most historic city for um, African architectural art because it has the largest collection of Moorish architectural art in the Western Hemisphere. And it's like a hidden history that's not known inside of the United States or in the Western Hemisphere. So I'm looking to connect the, the history of Africa to Opalaka and bring forth that. Um, I'm now sitting as the president of Opalaka Main Street District and we just got designated by the state to become a Main Street and to bring in economic development and revitalization. So during those efforts, I'm looking to bring forth um, a consulate and different things like that and international diplomatic missions. So. Yes, I'll touch more on basis on that when I go over my um, presentation for the plans for the city of Opelika in downtown. Thank you so much. No uh, problem. Fantastic, just fantastic. Uh, Mr. Miles, Mr. Ron Miles, tell us a little bit about how you get connected to this work and, and what you're doing in Baltimore. And uh, you're you're on mute. And if you could uh, put your camera down so we could see your face, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah, it appears I'm so pleased to be in the company of you young people. This is actually my 50th year in doing community work. I started in community work in 1974 as a community organizer here in Baltimore um, with the Archdiocese of Baltimore, uh, the Archdiocese of Baltimore. And since that time, I've moved ahead and moved into uh, community development work. You know, after you do community organiza organization, you get into the bureaucracies. 
And um, here in Baltimore, I don't know if you're familiar with neighborhood housing services, but um, that was on the very early days of Urban Reinvestment Task Force at the time when I um, worked to put together the NHS of Baltimore. And then I evolved from there and became the first director of one of the neighborhoods here in Baltimore. And then the agency itself recruited me to develop what we call expansion NHSs along the whole East Coast. So working in Atlanta, um, Chicago, you know, even West, even Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So it's been um, a, a road for me. But anyway, where I am today is I'm working here in Baltimore. I actually was the uh, director of the field office in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which was first stated. I retired from there in 2011 and returned to my home. Baltimore is my home. And this is a lot of development that's going here. And I, I now reach out and serve as a volunteer in many of our vulnerable communities. This is where development is taking place and our communities are not aware of the process in order to uh, lobby, in order to negotiate, not only uh, community benefit, I would call it, um, because again, here in Baltimore, we talk about um, gentrification of neighborhoods. But when, when I dig down into Baltimore, I find that it's more of regentrification because this is one of the um, ports back in the days of uh, immigrations. And um, so we then assume spaces after white folks leave out. And whereas it'd be a question that we're all gonna ask is, we talk about white flight, but we also need to be talking about um, black flight, especially black middle-class flight, because it appears to me, and I've observed where we leave the popo with the popo. And then you have the developers coming in now doing different kinds of projects. Um, and fast forward, I'm the um, founder of the RJY Chick Web Council. Um, there is a recreation center here that's in a billion dollar project area. We're all familiar with choice as well as what housing authorities do around the country as far as retooling communities and transformations of communities. But this was a Chick Web Rec Center. It's the only recreation center in America that was actually built from the ground up by not just black folk, but nationally known black folk. Um, Chick Webb, who is one of the most famous drummers in the country during the Harlem Renaissance, was a Baltimorean. And the city had the audacity to want to demolish that center. But in finding out that on Chick Webb's death wish, he wanted you, we couldn't go to no recreation center, no public facilities here in Baltimore that black folk could go to. But Chick Webb wanted a rec center for black kids and on his deathbed, this is what he wanted. And there was a Dr. Young who carried that wish out. So in February, 1940, we had Joe Lewis, Ella Fitzgerald, Jackie Moms, Mabley, Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong. They were all friends of Chick Webb. And they came to Baltimore and raised the money to build the center. Um, the community put the money in war bonds, came back out and from the ground up, you know, that's why I said we do a lot of things in building, but when you have nationally known black folks to build this center for black kids in Baltimore, and it was threatened for demolition. But now, over the last seven years, we've had, I've worked to have it designated historic, and now the city is, is under construction now at $20 million. And one of the things I'm saying to our communities is this redevelopment is coming in. They satisfy us with jobs. But after the jobs, what do you have? They call that uh, community inclusion. But where is the community benefit? So I'll be reaching out now that this center should be managed and operated by the Black community if, in fact, we can build the structure that will do that because it becomes very, very critical. And I'll tell you, it is a struggle. If we, if we look into the center of this particular facility, Let's not just get the jobs up front, but have something in the back. Even when you're doing apartment complex, why not the management and operations go under creating an LLC for the residents uh, to manage at least their homes, but instead they get out of town business people and, and um, we, we come out with nothing. So again, that's the message that I'm taking to folks now about self-management 
give the community a benefit and not just the upfront jobs that they promise, oh, we're going to hire the community people. And it's, it's really a struggle. No, thank you so much, Mr. Miles. Uh, that that's a, a deep history and and experience, and we'll um, come back to that. Um, if you would, Mr. Miles, are you able to bring your camera down a little bit? I think we want to be able to see your face. I'm, I'm having challenges. Okay, now that's what I'm saying. You got me now uh, with the tie on everything. Oh. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, it was great. I was I was trying to let you go. Um, now we have, uh, you know, Ms. Tamara Prosper, if you just give us a, a brief into who you are, your, the work that you're engaged in, um, and, and how we can, you know, uh, connect to it. Hi, I'm Tamara Prosper, um, and the work that I'm engaged in uh, in this field is with Cooperation New Orleans. Um, we're a cooperative economic development company, um, a worker self-directed nonprofit organization, and uh, what we do is really try to help Black, Indigenous, and marginalized people in New Orleans have access to equity, capital, uh, funding, and technical assistance to build their own businesses within their um, own communities. I come to that having lived in New Orleans uh, most of my life at this point, um, having the business of Show Fresh Foods, which developed out of the food deserts that came from Hurricane Katrina or that were exacerbated by Hurricane Katrina. Um, also having the tour guide company, I, I'm just very well versed about a lot of the history of the Black neighborhoods and the uh, Black culture and people there because that's where my tours focus. Um, and then most of my career has been in healthcare. And in digging to root causes, I've seen so many of the social determinants of health are mainly um, financial, access to secure housing, uh, decent food, um, a, a safe place to stay, getting out of an abusive situation. Most of that is financial. And so my goal in this position as a loan steward with Cooperation New Orleans is to really address those financial things um, and to really address the extractive labor and lending that always happens in our communities so that we can build our own and have our own. And um, when we can get our economic situations in a better order, I feel like that will help us address a lot of other things. Thank you so much. Uh, as you see, we have a wonderful uh, panel uh, here with deep experience and deep roots and uh, we'll have a, a sort of great discussion. So what I'm gonna do now briefly is go through a little bit about hands and then maybe set some context for, um, for our discussion um, today and uh, really um, excited you know, about uh, that opportunity to do that. And so as you uh, have you know, listened to everyone, um, you know, just sort of keep in mind the questions that you like to do. You don't have to hold them to the end. If there's something in Q&A, uh, let us know, because uh, again, we want this to be uh, really interactive. So I'm going to talk a little bit about hands and then lead us into sort of the context uh, for our discussion. Um, and in the chat, just make sure everyone can, uh, everyone can see my screen. Y'all are my feedback group panel, so great. So I'm the co-founder of HANDS, which is Historic African-American Neighborhood District Summit. Uh, we work to preserve, enhance, and elevate historic Black neighborhoods and commercial districts by strengthening the connections between the people who serve them. Um, actually, um, uh, you know, also shout out to Ron HANDS, who was, who was there in the early stages. Uh, we were seed funded by the National Trust for Historic Preservation's African-American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. And really, uh, this proverb is worldwide, but it's something that means something, uh, particularly in our tradition, uh, which is many hands make light work. Um, hands is a national network of organizations and people preserving, promoting, and perpetuating historic Black main streets and neighborhoods. Uh, we're a recurring summit of enthusiasts, researchers, residents, practitioners who want a fellowship for the good of the cause, and we're an advocate to support the next 100 years of Black main streets and neighborhoods. Um, this 
began as a partnership and very organically by two Black-led organizations. I worked uh, for a CDC in Birmingham, Alabama, in the Birmingham Civil Rights National Monument, which is, if you know about the dogs and hoses and the movement for civil rights, uh, that neighborhood is also um, has an economic heritage. And I worked for a Black-led organization that worked to preserve that, a 40-year one. Um, and in our natural travels, we began a fellowship with our other civil rights, Urban National Monument, who was also in the Main Street Network. So shout out to Regina as well. Um, and began to understand that there is a need for a uh, sort of comprehensive uh, fellowship, leadership, understanding that is Black led um, at this nexus of cultural heritage preservation. And we also understood that we did not know what we did not know. Right. And so I'll tell you a little bit about me. I'm from Mobile, Alabama. I've lived uh, all the way up and down the Midwest Great Migration Path, ending in Chicago, um, but starting at the terminus in, in 65. And this uh, is two blocks from where I grew up. Um, Dave Patton was a contractor at the turn of the 20th century, uh, and he was a Black millionaire. Um, who built my high school, which was segregated until 1974. And so this is now the parsonage of Stewart Memorial Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, but I used to walk past this uh, just in my everyday hood travels. And I'm like, well, why is there this Mediterranean building? And so one day, um, as the plaques start going up, <laughs> Um, I began to become more curious about the neighborhood that I was in. And then going to college, uh, I went to Birmingham, Alabama for UAB, majored in economics. And on the way to seeing 16th Street Baptist Church and a place that's so sacred for our folks, when I was walking back, I'm like, there are Black folks here in business, and it looks like they own it. And so after I graduated um, and spent a little bit of time in the private sector, I was afforded the opportunity to work for the CDC that protects this mostly um, Black-owned uh, place. And so here's what it looked like in 1937, the store 4th Avenue Business District. Here's what it looks like today. Uh, this, this sign is on this side of the street. Um, so, you know, you, you figure out what happened there, but it's still, we got the other side of the street. And then, of course, our sister organization, Sweet Auburn, which still has a lot of Black ownership, like Birmingham, which also makes us a little bit different that we're 40, you know, there there you know, histories, decades going back of Indigenous um, Black land ownership. And this is what part of it looked like in the yesteryear. And here's where it still is. If you're ever in Atlanta, Atlanta Mangoes is a fantastic Jamaican restaurant <laughs> to go to. Uh, and so there's this heritage that's in the present tense. So as we began uh, to, to think through this organic fellowship and what it could be, um, this symbology sort of arose. I went to Durham. Um, and shout out to Aya Shabu at Whistle Stop Tours, a fantastic griot um, in her own right. And they began to talk about the Fitzgerald Bricks, uh, which was from a Black brick maker and also one of the first uh, folks to found the North Carolina Mutual Insurance Company. Um, and the way that they memorialize uh, sort of these bricks um, throughout uh you know, Haiti and Black Wall Street in Durham, which was uh, one of the only other places called that initially outside of the Greenwood District, uh, is that they began to wonder uh, if the insignia on the Fitzgerald brick um, also related to these African symbols. Um, and so for us, this is all of it that we, we take into it. Uh, the golden age of Black business and, and adage to um, you know, the Fitzgerald break and really just this this notion of continuing the legacy. So really, when we think about um, we want to advance community and knowledge and historic, you know, and cultural heritage preservation, 
um, equitable growth and redevelopment, community organizing and leadership, and Black entrepreneurship and ecosystems. And have begun to do that through some monthly networking, facilitated connections, and research. We're still very young, Nason. I'm still meeting people, and all of this is volunteer work as of now. <laughs> But here's what we have done. Uh, we had our first digital convening on the um, beginning um, of the Greenwood Centennial. Um, then we had our first sort of in-person summit uh, with many folks in 2022. And uh, given all of this sort of trial, we are uh, looking to launch formally as a network this year. So we're excited for that. And here are just some of the people from across the nation who attended. So, um, and of course, we support Black folks, Black vendor, vendors, and supply chain. All of that is, is really important, entire Black supply chain uh, to help us produce everything. So, um, as I said, uh, we're working uh, really on the network. We've, we we uh, have taken the one-to-one -one approach, meeting people across the nation. Um, and so, uh, just thinking about how we do that. But... As we get into our conversation today, um, I wanted to set some, some definitions or discussions um, about what is a Black historic district, right? Um, so, you know, everyone uh, in, in the popular consciousness, and I probably should have included this, uh, uh, that, you know, the, the knowledge around Black Wall Street particularly has risen sharply over the past 10, 15 years, but definitely 10 years. When we say Black Wall Street, this was something that Booker T. Washington helped to coin in his travels. He was actually on the way to a historic Black town in Bowley, Oklahoma. Uh, and on the way, someone asked him to, to write about it. At the same time, uh, W.B. Du Bois was on assignment to write about Durham and the Black middle class uh, elaborating there. So when we talk about Black Wall Streets, really uh, this was one way to do it. And, and it's a specific thing. Um, there's a lot of discussion about if we use that term, but I let folks have their terms uh, that they have in their time. But when we talk about the streets or these neighborhoods, um, there are some nuances. You heard, uh, um, Ms. Mr. Miles talk about uh, the neighborhood in Baltimore uh, that he'll talk a little bit more. You talk, you heard Ms. Silas talk about her neighborhood and some of the differences. And so um, let's say, let's try to maybe categorize what we might be talking about here, right? So you've got black settlements, right? So these are post civil war uh, settlements. There's actually an organization Shout out to Black Towns and Settlements Alliance, doing fantastic work um, across the country. Um, that these were either independently founded, uh, many a times Black built for a lot of different reasons. Um, and these were townships or unincorporated areas. So Greenwood started um, based off of an Alabama community in Tuskegee. So the first one, of the first planned uh Black communities in the nation uh, is called Greenwood in Tuskegee. Um, and he was inspired by the O.W. Gurley and got 40 acres with a reverse restrictive covenant. Um, so you have these sort of situations and Orange Mound in Tennessee. Uh, this is in the Memphis area that is incorporated, later incorporated and becomes a Black neighborhood in a larger city or municipality, right? So you've got black settlements that happen as early as we start, as early as we break the chains, and even before, um, and even before is is, is even a, a interesting discussion. Um, in Philadelphia, there were, uh, and and in some places in the north, there were communities um, of of free African Americans who had their own districts and things of that nature. Um, in New Orleans, I, there's just so many pieces, right? But let's just say Black settlements. Um, and then let's talk about what most people affiliate with is the golden age of Black business. I'm using terminology from Dr. Julian E.K. Walker, 
uh, who is uh, the the foremost scholar uh, on the on Black business history. She literally wrote a 400 uh, year compendium on it in two volumes. Uh, she's at the University of Texas. Y'all should look up, uh, look her up. But the golden age of Black business, which happens um, somewhere generally between the 1920s and 1950s, and also catches uh, the first and early uh, waves of the Great Migration. So here are some pieces here. So I here I have as my example the Fourth Avenue Historic District which is uh, a district that really began to take shape um, in the late 1890s to early 1900s um, and had um, Black serving institutions, um, Black built buildings, um, but not all Black built buildings. <laughs> um, some of the buildings were not owned by Black people. And in many ways, um, even like in Claiborne Avenue, many of these districts were um, co-located with other ethnic minorities at the time or people suffering under some sort of Jim Crow. And there was some level of cooperation um, to some extent, and then sometimes there was not. But so we can begin to talk about the golden age of Black business, quote unquote, um, both when uh, African-Americans migrate uh, to uh, industrial centers in the Midwest and North, uh, and then also as Southern cities sort of retrench. And so, um, for example, folks in Alabama who are in the Black Belt move to Birmingham, and after about 20 to 30 years, they begin to, you know, build housing and settlements. Or if or, or folks uh, from the South moved to Chicago and developed Bronzeville, right? And then third, uh, which is something, you know, I get asked about often is what about after uh, the interstates, after, you know, sort of the dissipation of many of these neighborhoods? And let's just call these post-urban renewal, right? I'm showing you a picture of another neighborhood I grew up uh, and on the south side of Chicago called Inglewood. Now, if you would have told me when I was 15 years old that Inglewood wasn't always a Black community, I'm like, where and when, <laughs> right? But the fact of the matter is that much of the south side um, was uh, as a part of sort of the migration patterns um, of African-Americans due both to redlining, uh, constriction, um, all types of urban challenges. And so all of these are with us today. Uh, if we were to typologize them, we have, you know, neighborhoods that we have settled in and essentially been um, in a fabric of for 50 plus years. We have, you know, older neighborhoods that are coming up on 100 years, and then some neighborhoods that have been with us over 100 or 80 years. And all of them could be his Black historic districts and how we preserve them and power and the ownership, all of that really matters in a context. So just really quickly here, for the purposes of our discussion, I think it's, it's helpful for us to think about this in four different areas. You know, cultural heritage, preservation, and storytelling, how are we telling our stories? What are the stories we've missed? Um, what is the power of storytelling? Who tells the story and the narrative? And how is that economically related? Here's a picture of uh, Leanna giving a tour on Sweet Auburn. Um, how are we organizing ourselves? Um, here's a picture of Russell Place of Promise who's doing excellent work in Louisville in their historic Black neighborhood. And this is an organization that's community based, um, thinking about how to organize folks around investment without displacement. How do we think about equitable redevelopment? One of the things about Sweet Auburn that it's been able to achieve, particularly the John Lewis um, building that you see here that's you know nationally famous, or the, the mural um, here, is really a building that was developed by a Black woman developer, right? So what are the ways that we um, have equitable redevelopment? 
And then how do we also stir Black entrepreneurial ecosystems in place, which we've got a lot of that. Here's a program that we worked on in Birmingham um, uh, for Black entrepreneurship. Um, you know, I, I put this here uh, because I've been thinking about AI and what goes into AI and all of this things that we also, another thing we have, almost have to worry about. But it could be an interesting tool for us to think through um, what is the vision um, of our neighborhoods, um, what goes into our assumptions of neighborhoods. So we're running that experiment. So with that sort of context and background, um, I am ready to have this really great discussion. Um, and uh, again, all of the folks, please put in comments. We'll try to get to them. Um, but hopefully that gave you a little bit of background and some anchoring um, and to have, you know, some of this discussion. So with that, um, I want to kick off with historic preservation and storytelling. Um, and so the way this is going to work, everyone can respond, but I'm going to, you know, really call out uh, some folks that know that are doing some, some work. So my, my first question uh, is, you know, for you, Ms. Silas, you know, uh, what is the cultural and economic value of prefer preserving the story and, and how are you doing that? You have such a powerful way that you come to this work. Um, yes, I started basically, I, I spoke at the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland, in regards to bringing the history of the Morris to the city of Opalaka. So I really started the efforts in a, a very powerful way so that we can be able to tell our story. It is so important that we tell our story on large platforms so that we can be able to bring everything together yeah. to the community and to the yeah. people. And my whole goal and objective is to bring awareness and community involvement so that they can know their roots and what's going on around them in the history of the buildings. Cause they just look, and maybe it looks like Arabian Nights and Aladdin, but no, they need to know the history of the Moors and they need to know about the Moorish architectural art and how we get to where we are today. And I've, I've even been starting researching it and connecting it to the Native American history as well. And I'm just so interested for the community to know their roots. That's what I'm doing is all for the community for me. Thank you. Ms. Prosper, you, you have another hat, you know, as well um, around storytelling. Tell us about your approach um, and how you see this work. Um, my approach with tours is really to highlight the fact that New Orleans is built and everything that people love about New Orleans is due to the black and indigenous cultures there. Um, but when you go to have to study to get a tour guide permit and license, that's not part of what tour guides are taught to, to speak about and talk about. And so with that, and with my just lived experience here, I really focus on um, not only specific neighborhoods, but I ask people, you know, I, I curate tours so I can tell them what they want to know about based on neighborhoods. And what I can say is, um, people don't realize that all of New Orleans is a black neighborhood and has been. The New Orleans golden age of black business was actually prior to the Civil War uh, because there was such a community of free people of color here and they were more free um, really even before the 1800s because this was not a US American uh, British type colony. It was French and Spanish, and it was still a colony. They still had enslaved people, but there was just a different approach. And so there was more freedom of movement and ability to do things um, without those hard impediments. And so that lingers here in New Orleans. Uh, people may know from, from TV and things like the neighborhoods of Treme. People don't recognize that the French Quarter was a Black neighborhood for years because it was just old and people with assets moved out or, or people who could afford to go somewhere else did until someone decided, hey, historic redevelopment. And now, you know, it's, it's very hard to afford to live in the French Quarter. Um, but much like Miss Silas, I really try to focus on the fact um, that a lot of the things that you see and love and recognize in the city don't give 
credit to where those things came from. And, and the cool thing about New Orleans is families have been here for decades and decades and generations. So when you start researching and reading about the names of someone who's here, that same name is like, your neighbor, the guy at the bank, those kinds of things. So the history is really living and vital here, which really makes it helpful as far as economic development, because people know, um, they don't know all the details, but they do know the stories, what you know their grandparents told them or the elders of how things were. Um, and so in a way, it's a little easier to connect those dots. Um, and also in New Orleans, didn't have that firm spatial segregation during um, Jim Crow and civil rights. New Orleans is a very integrated city and always has been. There is no kind of, well, this is the good neighborhood and you drive over there and it's a bad neighborhood. They're like five and six blocks apart. If you don't know where you are, you could really end up where you shouldn't be um, as far as, you know, different kinds of neighborhoods and things like that. And so the integration of living together, although the economy and the schools and and you know the social things were segregated and in some cases still are. Um, we have that benefit of proximity and and that kind of experience that history is very close to the surface here. Thank you. Mr. Miles, uh, you know, if you could, you know, tell me briefly you know, around sort of the value of storytelling. Mr. Miles, I think you're on mute. Challenging. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna focus, although I've been um, quite around and I was, I just read just, just off the, about West End. I worked over in West End for a while and I see that they're about to do something with the West End Mall. But anyway, I'm concentrating here in Baltimore because just like uh, the, the Louisiana, when you look at Baltimore, and the early immigrants, you know, we had one of the highest levels of um, freed Black folk here in Baltimore that started down at our harbor. And now what we find there is, um, you know, that was to, we highly segregated. It, it's Baltimore that pretty much established the groundwork for segregation in different neighborhoods. Um, so where I am now is just recently, I had to share with the community, as we talk about our Black communities, I had to share with them that in the lower part of Baltimore, actually it was settled by a number of the early immigrants. Um, primarily it was German, and we had the Polish and the Italians and the Irish. So we here talks about the Black community. We assume those spaces when, and I'll call it desegregation, we assume their spaces after all of them left. Because even when I researched and looked at the churches, when you look at a community, you can find out who, who lived there by, by the churches. And even our Black churches, what we call Black neighborhoods now, is we assumed the spaces of the different churches for the different immigrant groups. But then I'll be saying to folks now, how do we capture our neighborhood without continual transition. Because as we now assume these spaces, when we were segregated and you had doctors and lawyers and the po -po living with the po, po here in Baltimore, we don't have that anymore. We have our, our black community, middle class, and moved up and moved out into suburbia and we continue those transitions. And then we talk about folks coming back who's now re-gentrifying rather than gentrifying. And I share with folks, if we are rehab mama's house that she struggled to get, and instead of moved out to the county with them flim-flam houses, then you would have a community. So I'm pressing that kind of thing here in Baltimore now of assuming, building a culture. We have lost a sense of culture of unity because we got a, a, a separation a social economic. Here in Baltimore, we have the east side and you have the west side. Um, wow, it's tough. So on the west side, when you had to found the NAACP and all of that, that's where the west side, you might've heard of Pennsylvania Avenue. And I say, we were consumers. When we talk about a main street for black folk, 
We didn't own a dang on thing. We were consumers and made the Royal Theater popular. Then when you had the urban renewal, our community people embraced the changing of our communities. And then we go back and talk about what we had. So that kind of thing is still going on. So I'm educating folks now of embracing place that even where our churches are, when our, when our um, pastors now don't live in the neighborhood, they live out in the suburbs, and then all our church yards are filled during the, during the service, and they be gone after two o'clock. Right, right. So I'm talking to a couple of pastors now that if you build around and you have create a not only housing, but let's begin to create an ecosystem of the culture hubs, culture and business. Don't just build the houses right. where your people can walk to church rather than drive to church. church. Well, so it's a real challenge here as far as our our cultural identity of reinvesting in ourselves. No, thank you all for that. And and I want to sort of pick up on that. So as we, we've talked about storytelling and preservation, we haven't left that. It's just going to build. But I want to introduce uh, sort of another piece here uh, because so critical to cultural heritage preservation and being able to preserve stories uh, ethically, right? Being able to uplift people who are there. Part of that is being able to have a um, an organization um, that is uh, anchored, um, not anchored in the community, but is the community, uh, because I don't, you know, how that you know how that works, and that's really sort of all the folks that we have here. Um, I'll give you a little bit. I'll, I'll give you a stat um, that came out. Uh, according uh, to the Young Black and Giving uh, Back Institute, which was supported by the Nielsen Foundation and Data for Good, uh, they found that most Black-led nonprofits operate on less than $500,000. And in, in fact, the study goes on to say uh, that the sort of net assets of white organizations, as you know, is astronomically different. So with that concept, um, understanding the need to preserve stories, carry on legacy, uh, and connect with youth and, you know, connect with people from a Black leadership perspective and organizational perspective of which all of you all um, sort of are a part of or lead, would love to understand um, the strategies that you all take day to day to preserve the integrity of the organization and resource the organization that that sort of does this work because it's not easy. So I'll start with you, Miss Silas. Like it's so important to have um, this work. What are some strategies you've used to, um, you know, carry forward this legacy and and it its operation? Um, right now, um, we just got the designation from the state um, this past year. So I had to create a board and create membership in order to create the Main Street District. But it, it started first with just basically being able to convey our story to the public and letting them know the history because a lot of people are una unaware of the roots. So the first thing was to really let them know, okay, we're talking about the Moors here. We're talking about Moorish architectural art. We're not talking about Arabian Nights and Aladdin. So that was important. That was the first thing that I had to start getting that um that narrative out there. Like once you get that narrative out there, and then I started building out um relationships. I started building out relationship, diplomatic relationships to be able to connect the history and bring the history forth. Because it's one thing to say, all right, these are Moors and this is Moorish architectural art, but we need to get some Moors here so that they can tell the community their story and their roots. So when it comes to organizing, that's what I had to do. And now Catalyst Miami is a huge organization in Miami-Dade County. And they do a program called Miami Our Way, where they go into different communities and they talk about gentrification and everything. So I just recently connected with them so they can do an open lock our way. And so that they, the community can see where they're lacking, where they've been and where they're going and how far they need to go and where we are right now. So during the designation of Main Street and bringing forth the Main Street, 
what would you like to see over here? What changes would you like to um occur? What do you think about businesses? Why is it so hard for the businesses to come to in Opalaka and work with Opalaka? So these are all the things that will happen in a forthcoming event so that the community can have their seat at the table. This stops gentrification. This brings forth economic development. It brings forth historic preservation and the community have an input in what's going on. So I think it's very important when you're talking about bringing forth economic development and bringing forth change. And you know, anytime you see development, the residents get scared. Like I sat over there with Liberty Square when it was redeveloping and rebuilding. And Liberty Square is one of the oldest housing projects in the United States. So I witnessed firsthand with the residents being afraid and not knowing what's going on. And they get so nervous and they will come into our meetings and it would be like really hectic. So I said, when we're going through this process, let's make sure when we're talking about bringing forth the main street, bringing forth uh, commercial dollars, bringing forth more businesses, let's make sure that the community and the residents and the businesses that are already established in the community have a seat at the table so that we can know how we can feed their needs because they're important. So that's how you, you, you create strategies. You feel the needs of the community and you bring everyone to the table so that you can bring them together. Like yes, development does not mean displacement and it shouldn't mean displacement. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Miles, can you tell me a little bit about how your organization is structured, is particularly around the facility, briefly, if you could. Yeah. You're on mute, Mr. Miles. Hey. <laughs> if I need, yeah. Okay. I have a, um, first let me tell you how we evolved. First, we started out as an ad hoc group when the city was going to demolish the um, Chick Web Center. And um, um, we started as an ad hoc group. And I had shared with the group that was an ad hoc group that served as the um, savers of the, the, the demolition. I said, moving forward, we need to formalize. We need to formalize and create an entity, one that's separate um, from the city of Baltimore, but independent, that we, although designated historic, what then are we going to do moving forward? That is why I created the nonprofit to become advocates and proponents for the center moving ahead. You cannot just stop at designation because it was the center was neglected for over 70 years. So here we are in, in doing that. So and then the other piece is we are too much in silos. So my idea now is because of the significance of the Chick Web Center is bridging East and West. So my board is actually people from all over. But I'll tell you this, it is so difficult to get the internal people that's right around the center. It's a very vulnerable community. I don't, you know, I don't undermine any people, but for them to embrace and, and tell them the story, I hardly get any support from the internal community. So I look at us as being citywide to address a citywide facility. Because Baltimore here, our councilmen, they call it councilmanic um, courtesy, where they think they can channel in on this neighborhood, had to redefine what neighborhood and community is because the government will channel you in to say, you're not a community resident because you don't live within these boundaries. But it's broader than that, whereas you get people with a self-interest to come on board to participate. So that is what we do. And I mean, this is, I've got people nationally that's part of our board, not part of our board, but part of the input um, by reaching out and telling, telling the story. Because in anything is that when we even go to your church or you go to social organization, people give to the cause and to what you are doing. We don't have to do all these fundraiser things, but does this pitch you as far as an interest that you want to invest in? And then I look at, after we get that investment, then we'll go to negotiate because the big language today is equity and inclusion. And then it's benefit. 
We fail on benefit. So Absolutely. now if you have the story, you know the significance, you're investing in yourself and you and you go to the table with something and not have your hand out. Well, because you know, we, right. we have to deal with that as far as look at the inequities over the course of years as to what was neglected to give, not even reparation, but given in. And and that's a good point. Uh, when we talk about investment, I want to toss it to Ms. Prosper, right? Because you, you work for a cooperative and thinking about investment and community um, and organization differently. Could you tell us a little bit about your organization and, and those principles of how you uh, engage? Yes, well, we are, we're a worker self-directed nonprofit. So that's simply like we were a nonprofit that functions as a cooperative. We don't have like an executive director here and a fundraiser over there. We work as a committee. Um, and what we do to really get the community engaged is we have quarterly, um, we call them ecosystem gatherings. And so we'll pick a uh, location in the community. In September, our ecosystem gathering was at um, a black owned vegan restaurant and they have a courtyard outside. And so we had a little music, food, you know, some entertainment, a little kid station. We always have a kid station so people can bring their children um, and not have to worry about childcare. Um, and we just invite the people in our networks. It's very much of a, you know, trying to speak to people directly and invite the people who you know and ask them to bring who they know and really talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. And so we do this every quarter just to keep our ecosystem in touch, to update them on the different things we're doing, the new cooperative businesses that are being developed to help the different cooperative businesses get to talk to each other a little bit and mingle because we want them to support each other as well. Um, the one we did in, sept in December was at uh, the location of a developing cooperative called Urban Dream and they um, plan to have an event kind of community space. And so we really try to do those hands-on things, especially post pandemic when we actually can gather and get together um, and to really in person share what we're doing. But we also have a quarterly newsletter. Um, we also really try to stay in touch with all of the technical connections. We've got Signal, we've got Instagram, or, you know, all the different social media, um, just to really get the word out there. So then people know, hey, this is a different way to build a business. Um, you don't necessarily have to have this level of capital and venture capital and angel investors. And, and, you know, we know that banks will say, we'll start with the friends and family round and our friends and family round can't just give you $20,000 to get your business started. We might be frying fish plates or something to get that going. And right. so we're really trying to get the word out that, hey, there's another way that we can do business. It really isn't brand new. We've been cooperating and collaborating as a community really forever since we've been here and before we got to this continent. Um, and so we're just applying that to business. And it's just a, we try to make it on, an organic growth. We also invite um, other neighborhood organizations uh, and their representatives so that they know what we're doing as well. And we can all spread the word. No, thank you all. Um, I, I think I heard a few things there, you know, one, uh, Ms. Silas, you know, talking about the way you've been able to, um, you know, have the community inform development and then partnering uh, with the capital in your community to make sure that, you know, you control it. Um, I heard from, you know, Mr. Miles being able to rally uh, even people who are departed from a neighborhood, um, you know, around an affinity and that that sort of connection. And then Ms. Prosper, I heard um, just being in the community and letting and having that exchange happen, um, all really critical um, and from an organizational uh, development. So now, you know, we're going to move into, you know, we've established, you know, stories are important. There's a lot of stories we missed. There's a lot of work we've got to do in our own communities um, to, to let folks know. We've talked about some of the challenges and strategies for you know, how we preserve and, and, and do this work. 
But let's talk about some of the macro challenges uh, that we all know about um, and how we're dealing with these uh, in real time. Um, so, you know, this 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 could be its its own very specific conversation, uh, but I want all of you to sort of, you know, talk about how you're addressing one or two pieces of it. And that's really equitable redevelopment in this sort of landscape where cities are growing again, even post pandemic um, and how our neighborhoods are under threat. I'll give you some few stats for context, according to. Uh, the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, uh, most of the neighborhoods that gentrified from 2000 to 2013, um, and even they did a follow-up to 2017, most of them were minority neighborhoods. According to Andre Perry's uh, Brookings report, which many of you all have heard from, our houses uh, are devalued by a factor sometimes by 7% or more. <laughs> Uh, and we also know uh, that um, in terms of displacement, uh, there's so much more work to be done in terms of understanding the, the current displacement. And I even struggle with saying that there's a post-renewal period because uh, uh, some have said that there is a urban renewal logic that, that uh, stays. So I think I would like to talk about uh, the reality of Black home ownership um, in some ways uh, have remained stable and then of other ways been eviscerated <laughs> in certain neighborhoods. Uh, one, of the con one of the threats that uh, Black neighborhoods and not even in historic, the places where Black people gather uh, are tangled titles and institutional investors. In fact, there are studies being done in, in cities like Philadelphia and St. Louis that show that the most amount of tangled titles and institutional investors are in the same neighborhoods. Um, over 30% of the new homes that were bought in the Atlanta metro region were institutional investors, the, the super REITs, the other corporations. Uh, and these are many times single family homes uh, in Philadelphia, uh, the Pew Charitable Trust uh, did a study that showed that West Philly and North Philly uh, had the Black neighborhoods had the highest amount of both institutional investor activity and quote unquote tangled titles. On the other perspective, we have this notion where um, we may have a historic Black commercial district, um, but some of the buildings still may not be owned by the Black businesses on the street level and have never quite frankly been owned. Um, and many of the businesses have not been able to prosper because they suffer from triple net leases uh, from a family that's owned that piece of property and refused to reinvest in it. And then on the other hand, for those districts where Black people have been able to own, we're dealing with two things. One, you're dealing with the, the silvering of, of boomers um, and, you know, the distance between where boomers are and where Black millennials are. And you're also dealing with the fact um, of, you know, decades of being locked out of capital to reinvest. So let's just simplify this question. What is your perspective or approach to dealing with displacement? Miami is a hot market. Baltimore is heating up. New Orleans, oh my goodness, everywhere, even places that were, uh, you know, not as, even places that were more desolate and, you know, everyone was suburban, urban is the new thing. Urban core is more, you know, desired. So how are your organizations thinking about how to create advanced black wealth so to stabilize the ones that's there uh, purchase property, <laughs> um, keep property, because at the end of the day, the best the best part of uh, I'm getting to you, Mr. Biles. I, I know this is your specialty. I'm gonna get to you. Uh, um, how? What are some tools, some tactics, and they don't have to be perfect, as no one has figured it out. Uh, that Black communities are able to sort of stabilize Black ownership assets and wealth. And so, um, Ms. Silas, I'll start with you. 
um, to, to get your both perspective, your challenge. This is real talk uh, and, and some of the strategies. Well, I believe the strategy to for in order to stop displacement. Um, I know we all heard of development displacement and it has been happening historically in our communities throughout the course of history. And I think that the answer to development displacement is cooperatives, cooperative living and cooperative housing, because that's the way that uh, we're, we collectively come together so that we can live amongst each other and have community ownership. And I have a development plan that incorporates all 17 of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And it creates a place where you can work, live and play. And it, it implements agriculture, um, living units, um, food mart, education center, in office spaces, anything that you centrally need, a kitchen incubator space, it teaches the community and it also creates an opportunity for the community to have ownership in their own community collectively. So I think that's the answer to development displacement because we collectively own our own community now. Thank you so much, Ms. Prosper. Um, yes, that's some of, well, I, I want to start with yay cooperatives. Um, some of the work we do is just educating people about programs that are already in place. Uh, New Orleans has programs, um, the homestead exemption program where you, you know, you pay a limited amount of money on uh, your taxes if you live in the home. Um, there are uh, special easements on your tax assessments for elderly people, for veterans and disabled people. Um, and so one thing is just letting people know that, hey, we, we recognize that the property values are changing, therefore the taxes are changing, but you qualify for a program that can help you um, to, to keep that down. Um, one thing that we also support as, as well as capital is looking at community land trusts, which really go to what uh, Ms. Silas was talking about in that um, we've got a few organizations here where they basically own the land and someone can buy the building on the land and it just keeps the property value more uh, even. And so um, although the equity is affected on the home that they buy, if you're looking to live in a home for your whole life and not to flip it and resell it, you're a little bit less concerned about rapidly growing equity. In fact, rapid equity makes your taxes go up and puts you out of your home. And so we're seeing more community land trusts being developed here as well. Um, our main approach really is the economic development because we feel like if you have business, business ownership um, and you can really have a say over how you work and the money that you're earning, you can have a more um, financially stable life. And that way, as things are changing around you, you have the business, you, you guys can work together and develop what you're gonna do with the business instead of you know a boss saying, oh, I'm leaving, I'm going over here, or really having a major effect on your income. So we really just focus on getting people in business so they have the equity and ownership there. And we do help our businesses buy the properties that they're in so they're not dealing with extractive landlords. Thank you. Uh, now, Mr. Miles, I know that you are the the, the HUD expert, no, but I'm just asking you to answer briefly because we, we got to come back to some of the responses. I'm going to do that again because I've been in the field a long time. As I mentioned, I did work there in West End and I hit the ground there bringing in a new program. None of the people I talked to wanted to purchase the buildings that they were in right on Gordon Street. They were there and renting, no, you know, not holding on to what they have. And sure enough, a program came in and they were displaced because they were displaced because they weren't investing back into um, where they were, although they've been in the business for 15 years. I can also point to some other places. Unless we invest in ourselves and then begin to burn mortgages rather than look, when I'm working for HUD, I never told people that, that home ownership leads to wealth building. Because that was temporary people saying, I'm gonna live here five years and I'm gonna move. We then create a culture where folks get to know each other and build a community and a home. And then when they talk of equity, why? I'm gonna take out a second mortgage? Burn the deed, build a culture around the neighborhood 
where you are. That is my story to people now of investing in yourself, um, even with the business development or even the home ownership. I never told those people that home ownership builds well. It's your home. It's the roof over your head. You keep it comfortable. But we move in and move out. So you have a dysfunction of place. Hmm. I'll say no more on that one. Uh, that that very powerful. So this is, uh, again, a very rich discussion. I wish we could take pieces off of <laughs> everything you all said. Um, so we've talked about organization storytelling, and I think, Ms. Prosper, you talked about economic development as well as uh, Ms. Silas and even Mr. Miles. I think to, to wrap up sort of this conversation around um, the perpetuation of these neighborhoods, a key part of that is resident and business, you know, development, all that kind of stuff. And you can't separate the corridor from the neighborhood. So what are some strategies that you're thinking about for the perpetuation of the neighborhood, the defense of the neighborhood, and the growth of the neighborhood that is um, where there are opportunities for all Black people, uh, all identities to, to live and earn? Um, how are you thinking about that in real time? And, and if there's a project or a tool you're thinking about or trying to deploy, let us know. Uh, start. I'll start with you, Ms. Prosper. Um, I have the blessing of uh, New Orleans being a place where most people don't want to leave. Um, you know, you you came and helped during Katrina. Nobody was, people lived in their neighborhood. Like there were people in one part of New Orleans who really didn't know anything about other parts of New Orleans because their home, their school, their church, job, everything was within a certain neighborhood with all their family and community members. And so a lot of people would really like to get back to that. There are still people who are just in Atlanta or Texas or wherever post Katrina and want to come back. It's the economic system that's preventing them and now the skyrocketing real estate. And so for us, um, really stabilizing the real estate, um, providing more affordable housing, because one thing that has also grown here is a super high rate of unhoused people, which... Um, We've had them before, but not in these numbers. They're just a lot because of the real estate at this point. Um, and so really trying to stabilize that and do a lot of education. We're trying to get into the schools. We're starting a program this fall with Southern University. Um, we're getting involved with local lawyers. Um, there are several universities in New Orleans, and three of them are HBCUs, Dillard, Xavier, and Southern in New Orleans. Um, as well as Tulane University and Loyola University and Holy Cross University. And so we're trying to get all of these young students who come in town and get some of their ideas and get into the high schools to really, one, let young people know, hey, there are options for you. Um, some kids here, their goal is to get, you know, a good enough job so they can leave because they recognize how difficult it is here. And so teaching them about how um, cooperative practices work to try to go back to the way that, uh, you know, their grandparents and great grandparents did things as a community and then applying that to business and letting them know that, hey, the bank said no, this one said no, but we have access to capital. We fund businesses. We don't just do technical assistance. We provide money. Um, and we're not looking at your credit score and, and, and what assets we can possibly recoup. So um, really it's, a, it's educating people to know what's out there so that we can restructure the economy to retain the people who are here and to finally, for those who are still trying to come back after 18 years, um, you know, to be able to bring them back to something that's a, a lifestyle that's similar to what they had elsewhere. Thank you so much. Now, because we're, uh, I want to make sure we have enough time to interact uh, with our folks. Uh, Mr. Miles, can you tell me if I, there I, will be? I just have to make a comment. Yeah, comment about New Orleans. I, mean, I said I was in Tulsa when Katrina, and even though I wanted to place the people there, they wanted, in fact, go back to the ninth ward. 
I thought I would just share that. But no, that's, well, well, could you absolutely? Well, could you tell us really quickly? Well, at the Chick Webb uh, Recreation Center, will there be a black business or commercial component in its redevelopment? Okay. Um, what I'm pressing now is that the center comes under the Department of Rec. And I am now promoting and saying we got two years for construction. And I want a black group to come together that will manage and operate that particular center. I think it's very um, not operating very properly under the department. They um, crushed me out when I went to, I was promoting an economic development component as part of a cafe. And they just beat me up. And then they also wanted to put another gymnasium in the neighborhood, but was able to be successful to put a, a multi-purpose center there. So a multi-purpose educational center. So again, if it's if we're successful in getting an organization that's going to manage and operate it, it has a huge opportunity for um, economic development. Thank you so much. So Ms. Silas, take us home. Uh, what, are, what are some of the strategies uh, you're using to grow um, the next generation of Black businesses in, in, your, in your neighborhood? Well, as we know, Miami-Dade County is the most expensive place to live in America right now. Um, New York is more expense, expensive and California is expensive as well. But when it comes to the pay wage, the pay rate and the cost of living, it doesn't average out. So that's why Miami-Dade County is the most expensive place to live in America. But we're a tourist spot. So my goal is to be able to bring some tourists and economic development to the city of Opelika. And so how do we bring in tax incentives so that the city can be able to flourish? How do we do all of these things? So that's what I'm, that's the eyes that I'm looking at the city of Opelika through. Um, we do have a train station. So how do we bring in the Disney books from Orlando? How do we do these things so that we can create jobs within the city of Opelika so the residents can grow and thrive and that they can be able to grabs everything that's going on and they can be first in line for everything. So that's what my goal is when it comes to being able to bring in that um, that engine for Opelika. Thank you so much. Uh, if y'all want to put in your emoji claps for this fantastic panel, um, it is difficult to be disciplined uh, to keep us to 90 minutes, but I know this is the evening. Um, so a few things. I see a few questions in the chat. We'll try to get to them. Um, as soon as possible, uh, but I'll call out what's been happening in the chat. And just as a general, I think NDCC will be happy to provide all of our contact information for connections. So shout out to Adrian, who said he's working in uh, Baltimore. Shout out to Sherelle Swain. Uh, uh, the Rondo Community Land Trust is doing fantastic things. I'm a kid Griffin and glad to know Birmingham folks. Um, and uh, shout out to uh, Ralph Crowder, uh, who also uh, has got some, some um, folks in Minneapolis. A shout out to uh, Seattle. Um, know some folks at the, the Central District. Um, shout out to Adasha, Black Seed Farms. And uh, shout out to, oh, we got some folks, Eric Hutchinson uh, from Columbus. Um, yes, I, I, I'm aware of Bronzeville. Um, I, I definitely want to follow up with you. I think y'all have got y'all in a, a neighborhood thing with a, a bank. Um, and then um, we've got some other uh, opportunities for connection. I think uh, we may have asked one, answered one question, um, you know, around uh, follow up with uh, around gentrification and displacement. Um, and uh, in that, so yeah, do we have any other questions um, from the panel? Uh, and I don't see any more in the chat. I think we may have caught them all, but it's just so great to hear about uh, your neighborhoods. And I look forward to uh, everyone sort of connecting. Uh, Amal, I do see one raised hand. I'm, I, I see it in the attendees. Are you able to? figure out who, who that is. I see two raised hands. Yeah, I think two people have raised their hand on me. Okay, we've got 
I got for two quick questions and then we'll we'll wrap up. Irene, I think I um unmuted you, so you can go ahead. Yes, uh, inadvertently. Sorry about that. It was a mistake. Oh, okay. I'm good. Um, I think uh, Deborah, I unmuted you. You also raise your hand. Hey, unmute. Okay. Am I good now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I'm. Um. This is so on point for this this project that I'm trying to work on now in Atlanta, where uh, it's an area on MLK Drive called the Wall, and uh, it's the area where whites tried to uh, block off the black community when a, a prominent black man started building a home in a white neighborhood. So the um, white area, they protested and uh, tried to, and they built a wall. <laughs> they built a wall. And uh, my running club was running over there uh, one day, about three months ago. And uh, was told that the wall was torn down, but I passed by this area and it was just amazing where this house was kind of like up on an incline and at the bottom of the stairs, there was that wall. And uh, they actually built the wall up to the stairway of all of these homes. But this one section there that's still there. And I was trying to get the council person to put a memorial uh, plaque there uh, and for commemoration of that area and just let the people know that they weren't all free all the time, that that actually was happening. And the, um, they had to go to Washington to get the wall actually removed or torn down. So, uh, and that the council member is uh, trying to get funding for that project now. Thank you so much, Ms. Hargrove. Um, I, I definitely think, Edi, is your question around sort of resources for the market? Ms. Hargrove. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, I said, what was your question around resources to get the marker? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. does, does anyone have maybe a quick 30 second response um, to that? If if not, um, what I can do, I, would say, I know some preservation I, folks in Atlanta that might be able to help you with resources. Yeah. So I'm happy to connect you afterwards. Yeah, okay. and I would say oftentimes we defer to have our legislative people do things, but we got to remember they legislate. So from the community level, you have to kind of just go see who might uh, be attracted to that kind of activity and what you're speaking of and their resources there. But anytime you're onus to have a council person or a legislative person to do it for you, you owe them. <laughs> you owe them. So do as much as you can by looking up your resources and pretty much you could do it, pretty much get it through yourself and then get the support of that council person. Okay, thank you. Th thank you so much, Mr. Miles. I think we've got two more questions, one from Ms. Kelly and then I, and one that just came in the Q&A and then we'll turn it back over to the host. Um, I think uh, Irene uh, raised her hand by mistake. I unmuted her before, so I think we have one question. Um, my David Yoka in the Q and A. Uh, David Yoka, did you want to ask your question, or did you just uh, want us to respond? Um, I think. It's the yeah, the question is: Are any of you collaborating with researchers slash colleges to develop and enhance storylines for? your neighborhoods. Uh, that can be an open question to all, and then I can put in uh, a word after you all respond. 30 seconds. Uh, we're working with uh, local colleges, but not necessarily to develop and enhance our storylines, more to um, educate the community about what we're doing as economically, not so much historically. Mr. Miles, you had a response? Uh, yes, I, 
I've tried to, uh, I've reached out to uh, Morgan State Department of Planning. And of course I've used their um, architectural services. So wherever I can is just bring in those particular local resources. And I really need to move out some more so I can get some um, assistance for field work. <laughs> I'll see what the urban planners will do. Uh, Ms. Silas. Great. Um, I think you're on mute, Ms. Silas, yeah. Sorry, I didn't know I was mute. Um, no, I'm not working with a, um, a college specifically, but someone that's working in the city of Opelika to do some historic preservation, they're working with the University of Florida, I believe, or Florida um, University, one of them. Great. And then there's one more question. Um, I think we're out of time, but it says, do you have time to address my concerns about competing with out of state bulk landlords? Um, I, I think that was part of what we referenced earlier in the panel around institutional investors. I'm happy to send you a paper um, on it. It's actually something really being discussed and people are trying to think about policy methods. No one has fully figured it out, but finally it's starting to be studied. So we'd be happy to send that to you. And then in terms of uh, working with uh, colleges and universities, I would say that one of the goals that many of the folks that we've met um, organically and in a grassroots level and, and the, the network have basically mandated that. So that's one of the things we're working on. Um, to think through how to elevate um, the literature and the scholarship of our communities, particularly those scholars uh, from our community uh, and not uh, sort of outside eyes. And that's a really critical piece. And, and that's one of the motivations for this network. Um, and so that that takes some wrangling and resourcing. Um, and, and that's a whole different discussion. But look, you all, please give um, uh, another emoji, a uh, round of applause uh, to Ms. Silas, Mr. Miles, Ms. Prosper, uh, Ms. Masood for a fantastic panel. I want to thank um, uh, the Network for Developing Conscious Communities for inviting all of the panelists. Um, and I want to thank all of you all for being so engaged uh, on a Tuesday evening. Um, we hope to stay connected with you. We hope that this was helpful, tactical, um, and we just believe in community. So um, thank you, and I, I pass it back to them all. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Elijah, for having that conversation. It was really important. Um, we'll make sure to share the recording of this webinar um, on our social media platforms. We have a YouTube channel and also our monthly newsletter. So if anyone, you want to share this recording with anyone, um, it's this important resource. We can go ahead and share that as well. Um, and then we will also make sure to stay connected with all these panelists and wonderful speakers. Thank you so much for giving us your time um, and everybody. Thank you. Have a good night.